Well, they were busy at the State House last night with some cleanup work. We'll talk about it with Ted coming up tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. And it's early in the political season. You're also going to meet a, a new candidate for Congress, Jim Langevin. Better get it going because they're coming after him already. Welcome in. Nice to have you aboard on this, what is it, Wednesday night in mid-September. Ah, oh, summer is officially over. Now? Tomorrow, I think. What's today? The 20th? Mm -hmm. Is that all you got for me? You're not going to talk to me? Why? Is it something I said? Anyway, Ted will talk to me. He always does. Here's the headline. Six key bills, four of which I think made it. Two didn't, if I understand the cut correctly. Here's Ted's synopsis, and then we'll talk to him live. 63 in favor, zero. Rhode Island's 113 state lawmakers back in action almost three months after they abruptly stopped work due to a breakdown over the budget. With that dispute in the rearview mirror, the House and Senate reconvened to tackle unfinished business. By 413, substitute the time frame, the... Dozens of bills sailing through, including a measure to limit gun rights for individuals accused of domestic abuse. This bill will help keep victims of domestic violence safe by keeping guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. Today, we are considering on taking a constitutional right away because of a misdemeanor. We don't do that with any other constitutional right. Also set for final approval, a hotly debated bill to require most Rhode Island employers to offer five paid sick days a year. With this legislation, we've got an opportunity to make a concrete positive impact on over 100,000 Rhode Island workers. Last week, we're all lamenting that Benny's is closing and Alexion is, is leaving. Do we wonder why when we're doing stuff like this? I think that's a good question, don't you? I put it in the story. You did, <laughs> but uh, that argument didn't prevail. It did not, no. Paid sick days, made it. Welcome, by the way. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, in limited form, though, not five, three, four, and then five. Right. Successive years. Right. Yeah. This, and this the, was uh, part of the whole to-do between the Senate and the House when the mm -hmm. whole, you know what, hit the fan. Yeah, and you know, it's actually, I was thinking about it last night. We haven't talked a lot, I think, about the increasing power of a group called the Working Families Party, which is a progressive pressure group that uh, uh, they work closely with State Rep. Aaron Regenberg, who you heard from there, the progressive province Democrat is likely to primary Dan McKee next year. Um, they really pushed hard for this paid sick days bill, and they have a lot of the Democrats up there nervous after they helped take out John Simone, the former House Majority Leader, last year. So I think uh, they're both, you know, there are plenty of people who they are progressive, they're Democrats up there, but then there's also some electoral fear that a group like this might be able to rile up some of the, you know, kind of Bernie-type energy that's out there in the party for some of these comfortable incumbents. Yeah, and the business community doesn't have that kind of core influence or lobby. No, and you don't, you just don't. At least the small business community doesn't. Yeah, well, you often don't see as much of a push on... Uh, on the business side on things like this, with, with exceptions. I mean, I'd also point out that, you know, if you think about it, I bet a lot of our viewers watching tonight have five sick days, right? That's, you know, people, even not as great employers, often do five. But this is for part-timers, too. Uh, it is. And so the, uh, I, but I think for a lot of businesses, you know, as long as there was a carve-out and they didn't have to do anything different and they were set, it was, it's not that big of a deal for some of these larger employers because they already give the five sick days and they got a carve-out. Yeah. Where but for the smaller ones where maybe they don't have this, they're not able to, or with part-timers, you know, seasonal workers have a carve-out. Uh, I think that's where you're more likely to see uh, some, some complaining. Yeah, the phone lines to the radio show weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO have been full of business owners who say, you know what, I'm just going to cut down on vacation time. That's all. You know, so mm -hmm. we'll see what the compensation. Now, this thing is one of those things where you pass it, maybe be careful what you asked for. I'm not sure. We'll see how it works out. Yeah, and you know, and there is, you know, it's kind of a, you know, I think as a human being, most of us can sympathize with arguments on both sides. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want the mother who has a sick baby to be st stuck losing her job or something because she has to leave the baby well, or whatever. Well, it's about compensation for those days off more than it is losing your gig for not being. Well, and at the lower end, you know, you often can't, one day's work, you know, can really make a big difference. The flip side is, I was going to say, we all, I'm sure, have worked in places where we know when our friends, uh, the sun's out and it's nice, and uh, maybe uh, maybe the sick was a little more uh, sick of going to work. Mm. The gun rights thing is pretty controversial. The Republicans, you know, note that a misdemeanor can get you jammed up for your right to carry a gun. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose uh, from I was think as I listen to those arguments, I suppose it's right for a lawsuit. Then you mm -hmm. know, I mean, as Patricia Morgan said there, if it's a constitutional right and this isn't a, a legally acceptable way to, to take that back, uh, I would think that someone would have standing to sue uh, and to, to overturn it. But I think the domestic violence argument carried a lot. You know, this was in many ways viewed up there more as a domestic violence bill than a gun bill. You know, gun bills are pretty radioactive. You have a lot of uh, NRA friendly Democrats up there, but this was ended up being cast smartly by the advocates for it more as a protecting victims of domestic violence. This bill. firefighter pension thing is controversial. The governor's still struggling over this, correct? Yes, yeah, so this is to presume that any firefighter with a heart condition uh, it has an in the line of duty uh, injury because of that and should get a lifetime tax free accidental disability pension. Uh, cost to taxpayers estimated at 2.3 to 2.8 million extra dollars a year in these pension funds. Um, you know, I think I would be surprised if the governor signs this, but she could always not sign or veto it and it would still become law uh, since the assembly passed it. But, you know, the firefighters union has a lot of sway up there. I've heard a lot of talk about, you know, the heroism of firefighters, first responders. Uh, that, that carries a lot of weight. It's interesting that, you know, the firefighters got their bill, but the municipal non-public safety uh, labor union folks did not. Right, so uh, if we can put that whole list that I've been covering there up, if we haven't, to put it up one more time. Uh, yes, 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 on the legislative side, post-election audits, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, right? that's just, you know, just, we're going to make sure that the counts are correct after the machines come out on election night. But highway surveillance didn't make it, because I think everybody kind of went, who came up with this idea? We'll talk about that in a second, but what Ted was referring to is the Evergreen contracts, the last one on the list. We've done like half a dozen shows on this between the radio and the TV. Mayors have been apoplectic about this, really lobbying the governor hard. She vetoed that legislation from the regular session, and then they decided not to take it up. Yeah, and I, I was surprised. I thought there would be an override vote. I mean, this they all stood up to sponsor <laughs> it. No, I mean everybody who voted for it sponsored it. Yeah, I mean you know you have big Democratic supermajorities in both these chambers, and one of the backbones of those supermajorities is the rank and file union members, often public sector union members, who who march around and go get out the vote in these lower profile elections. And uh, I thought for sure, considering how many of them have already voted for the thing, because they all voted for it in June, it's just the governor vetoed it after that. But there was a lot of resistance, apparently, behind the scenes. Nobody wanted to go first. And this continued tension between the House and the Senate is in play here, where the, uh, how, the governor vetoed the House bill, because the House bill is the only one that passed because of the meltdown in June. So the Senate said, all right, the House has to override first, and then we'll override. And the House said, no, no, we don't want to override first. You, the Senate, have to pass your version of this bill, because they both pass versions. Have the governor veto yours, and then we'll veto them together. And the Senate said, no, we don't trust you. you got to go first. And the House said, no, we don't trust you. You have to go first. That's the story they've been telling the union lobbyists who don't necessarily believe it. They think it's a nice excuse for them to not take another vote they don't want to so take. So they're going to blame chicken or the egg dynamics here for not addressing a vote. It's very convenient not to have these <laughs> legislators who have a lot of heat on them not to have been on the record a second time. It's yeah. one thing to vote for the first time, it's another one to override the veto. Especially when it becomes a bill that was vetoed that you said, nope, uh, sorry, Governor, like you took your strongest stand you can against a bill, and we still said this needs to become Rhode Island law. Mm. Uh, so that that's an interesting one. I mean, the unions, the unions are in a tougher spot, I think, than people understand right now because the Supreme Court, especially now that President Trump has put Neil Gorsuch on the court, is going to once again take up one of these bills that would allow people not to pay union dues necessarily. And that would seem to have a lot of, uh, that could do very well, I think, up there at the Supreme Court. So that could change the whole landscape and politics in Rhode Speaking Island. Speaking of union things, real quick, I guess the Newspaper Guild having a little bit of difficulty, huh? They're marching around now. Yeah, you know, I don't get a ton of news releases from the union that represents the Providence Journal reporters, but I got this morning one pretty harsh saying they're down to 16 reporters, their pay has been cut, uh, they don't like seeing freelancers getting plum assignments rather than the staff members, and they're going to march outside the headquarters uh, tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, and then I talked to the publisher by email today, and she said, look, it's it's 2017. Newspaper business mm -hmm. is in very tough shape. You've got to change things. Paw socks. Give me 30 seconds on that. You and I were at the hearing. You stayed longer than I did. Um, <laughs> that was hearing number one. Of six. Stack in that deck, uh, even though I took the, you know, as they signed right. up routine, I mean, they cannot have another hearing with four hours of... Pro post up, yeah. Before I mean, the pro post I mean, the 
it's a bad. It also bad became object. the headline, right? We were, right. you know, reporters were looking for the hook, and to me, it was partly it took hours before the opponents got their say. You know, Billy Conley, the uh, finance chair, he was on your show, and he's been elsewhere. He's talked a good game about being transparent, and they are, you know, considering last night one. One committee posted a hearing at 7.44 for a vote at 7.45 with one minute's notice to pass a bill some deal had been cut. So, I mean, it is better than sometimes how they behave, having all these postdocs hearings. But I'm really perplexed on what's going to happen. I get the powerful forces are in fa that there are powerful forces in favor of this deal, but I just sense a lot of hesitance and all the way to outright opposition among a lot of rank-and-file lawmakers, especially as we get closer and closer and closer to an election year. All right, well, it's, uh, it's a play out over the next four or five weeks. Thanks for the roundup, Ted. Appreciate Thanks, it. Man. He's running for Congress against Jim Not Angevin. me. Not, no, not you. <laughs> Sal is. Stay with us. So I'm hoping that in spite of the president, Democrats and Republicans will find a way to start reaching out across the aisle to address, address the real big problems that are facing the country right now because certainly the president is not going to bring us together. Uh, you know who he is, Jim Langevin, our second district congressman, been around for a long time, and Sal Caiazzo says, enough, right? I say enough. Enough. Welcome. I do. Nice to have you. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. Uh, you're a Republican this time around. That's you ran correct. last time uh, in 2016 as an independent. I did. Correct. You got 4% of the vote. Mm -hmm. That inspired you to, to, to launch this campaign? <laughs> well, it inspired me. I never stopped running, to be truthful with you. I, um, you can go back and look at a couple of different issues that came about with certain Rhode Islanders. The most vulnerable, actually, the elderly and handicapped, as well as we'll throw some veterans in there as well, when they took away the bus passes. Mm. Dumb. I, uh, I rallied everybody together. I rallied people at the state house. We did what we had to do. Yeah. And they got it back. Yeah. Uh, Republicans generally don't jump into those conversations, but it seemed like a real common sense well, screw up on the part of the legislature. Well, I'm somewhat of a moderate myself, mm -hmm. so I don't want to show and portray myself to be too far right. Right. I mean, I, I like to stay in the center. So with personally, you, you've been in the, you were in the plumbing business for quite some time? For so many years, yes. And now you're uh, not working, correct? No. Okay. Um, disability prevents you from working? But not disability from, but not from banging military. door to door and... and uh, well, right? you know... Yeah. Uh, it's, a hard, it's hard work. It's very hard. I've been... It's been I've been hurting, truthfully. Really hard. Meaning? Well, I, you know, you get to walk around a lot. I have issues myself, you know, with feet, legs, sure. that type of thing. So, if... It's physical uh, hardship to, to do this. What motivates you past that to want to run for office? I'm a veteran. Actually, I'm a disabled veteran. This is how it all started. Uh, I'm also the founder of PoisonedVeterans.org. PoisonedVeterans.org. That's correct. Uh, I was at a base that was more or less contaminated, and we were exposed to all sorts of different chemicals. Hmm. And I'm not talking about Lejeune. And through the years, it started affecting all of us. In fact, our children as well. And I've been down uh, to Washington quite a bit lobbying and, well, I don't want to really say lobbying because people don't like that word that much, do they? But advocating Working it. for veterans yeah. um, with this issue. And I saw that there's a big need. There's a big need of common sense in D.C. That Jim Langevin's not providing? I think it's not just Jim Langevin. I think it's through across the board. I mean, Jim Langevin, I think he's a great guy. I respect the man, but we need a little more fight. So, or a lot more fight, let's put it that way. So are you running to win or are you running to make a few points? I'm running to win. Forgive me. That's okay. It's, you know, everybody who runs goes through these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. How are you going to accomplish that with what seems to be, at least from the last run, very little money, resources, staffing? Well, that's why I've gone with a thing. party. Uh, I've been getting a lot of help from different people. It's been totally different. Last time I was on you have a fundraising goal, a target you think you need to hit in order to be able to make well, an of effective course I run? Do. Of course I do. What is it? Well, it's obviously going to be in the six figures somewhere, in the high six figures. Hmm. That's why we start early. I haven't seen any, you know, there have been a lot of what I consider to be viable people run for federal office on the Republican side in this state. You very well may be one of them. 
can't get near that kind of dough in order to be able to compete. Why do you think you're going to be different? Because I'm the outsider. I really am. I'm not the establishment guy. And I think people in Rhode Island are going to see that and they're going to come on board. Is that Trump momentum we're talking about here? No, not at all. Not at all. And by the way, my uh, I see the piece of paper there with Rhode Island first. Yeah, we're, we're I came up with that. Time, yeah. uh, I came up segment. with that before Trump came up with America first. But anyway, well, we might as well throw it up what since I you feel said like. it. Uh, Eric, can we throw that up real quick? Uh, if you had a big screen TV, you could probably read through this entire thing. Rhode Island first abolish road. Uh, let, let's just tackle the first one. Abolish roadworks tolls. When Rhode Islanders said no, the politicians said yes. Now this mm -hmm. is. This is really a state argument, at least the federal delegation it is, is to kind a of state away point. from it. It's a federal highway system. No kidding, right. Let's think about that. Mm -hmm. And we can't hurt businesses even more than what they've been being hurt. So what would your angle for argument be from a congressional platform? Listen, there's going to be a lot of federal funding lost because of these tolls. I can see it coming. Why? Because it's a federal highway system. Because the the federal law, and I don't, well, don't quote me, we're going to be here on, on TV, so from what I believe, the federal, the federal Highway Administration acts show that the only way that they can actually put this type of tolls up on the federal highway is when there's a certain amount of work being done. Yeah. Until it's they, paid they, they for. They call it a bridge because they're going to say it's bridge work mm -hmm. while they're actually fixing the highway um, because of all the rigmarole going on with the feds. But they're working hand in hand with the feds getting this permission. So why would you? Are they really? Everything I've talked, everybody I've talked to with the feds, they've actually told me not. Meaning, you've been talking to the Federal Highway Administration about this? I talked to this? a few people the Federal Highway Administration. And they're telling you what? That, that Gina's are kind of running a runaway uh, More or less, here? yes. Well, you need to cite those federal highway and officials. And I most certainly will. Can you name them right now? No, I won't. Can Not you bring them to the table? Without them, I will be glad to. Yeah, because I think uh, we have heard very little and from we the have highway talked, officials. I talked to them last time, of course, being an independent. Mm -hmm. It didn't get very far, as far as I'm concerned. But now with your Republican affiliation, I think I'll be able a little to do a little more. Juice. more. Exactly. Huh. Party politics yeah. impacting the race. We'll come back and tackle a couple more of these issues on Sal's agenda. Stay with us. Sure, well, when you poll it, people, uh, they don't like uh, Obamacare, but they, they, they do like the Affordable Care Act. They're one and the same thing, but so... It, well, do you have a responsibility as a yeah. Democrat? Does I your party always, have a responsibility to, to make go, that point clear? I always try to call it the Affordable Care Act, even though it certainly was President Obama's legacy and one of his biggest legislative accomplishments and a very positive thing he did for the country. It, you know, I refer to it as the Affordable Care Act because that's where there's the most common ground and most people understand that it, it made a, a dent in reforming health care. It changed it in a positive way, and it's not perfect again, but uh, it made a, a change. You that was a conversation I had with Congressman Langevin uh, not, not too long ago. I, the premise being that if we just didn't call the Affordable Care Act Obamacare, it would depersonalize the politics of this entire thing. Now we have an uprising again and a two-week timetable for Republicans in Washington to get a new bill through. Some call it Trump Care too. Uh, your issues under Rhode Island First certainly uh, include discussions of health care. What's your thought on this? You support the Republicans' last stab here? Never have the government run the health care system. That's my first. Um, I think that we need to put out a much better plan for health care, meaning that we open up the borders. We have more competition. Open up which borders? The, the insurance borders. You're talking state to state? Exactly. Exactly. And you're thinking that does what? Well, I think that'll give better pricing for everyone. I really do. Uh, another thing, too, that we get to look at is the cost of medications. I, I get to look at it. I, I've been, I was, when I was in the military and also worked for the government for a while, I was in Europe. And I can give you a, a great, for instance, one type of medication here would cost, let's say, two, three hundred dollars. The same medication in Europe was like twenty. Mm. 
think about that. Why? Well, do you know why? Well, they say that it's because of research, and basically the people in America and the United States pay for that research, the, the R&D. I find it a little difficult because the R&D can just go so far. Do you have a platform of solutions on this healthcare thing, or are you just asking questions? No, I have a platform. My platform is quite simple. The federal government uses a Medicare system for pricing of medications. I think that would make a big difference if we just put that out to the whole playing field. So when you say you don't want the government involved in the health care system, are you saying you don't want the government regulating the health care system? You don't want rules and regulations? Rules and regulations have to be acts? there. Yeah. What I am talking about is I've heard a lot of talk from the other side of talking about Medicare for all and you know things like that. I think that's wrong because that is run by the government. Do you support the Republicans' plan here right now uh, to more or less package up some dough, one fell swoop, send you know a block of money to each of the states and let the states more or less figure out what the rules and regulations are? Well, I think it should are. be up to the states this to is, begin with. This I is mean, a state's issue. This is not a federal issue. Exactly. But however, the federal government needs minimum standards, okay. what are which they? are going to be high to begin with. What are they? Say for pre-existing conditions. They have to cover it. This particular bill suggests that pre-existing conditions ought to be covered, but mm -hmm. the insurance companies can charge a rate based on what your pre-existing condition is. I think that's wrong. So you don't support this plan? I don't support that. It's to a that key, part of well, the plan. It, well, it's a key element. I mean, I mean, this, I mean, this whole, this whole vote. Uh, reportedly, Paul Ryan, who you want to join down there, mm -hmm. says he will carte blanche whatever the Senate doesn't does. Doesn't necessarily mean that I get along with Paul Ryan's ideas either. Hmm. I mean, he can carte blanche whatever. If you have a pre-existing condition, it doesn't mean because of that you need to pay more. Uh, I think I, most I mean, people watching this say amen, but that's not what this bill says. No, it's not, so I'm not with it 100% of the way. Okay, well, you know what? It's going to be one of those things where we have to get you on the record as to whether you would support the legislation because Ryan, I would not at this point the way vote, it is. It, it would have to be amended. The Senate, that way you'd vote no as a congressman. It would, unless it be amended. All right, give me 30 seconds on why you ought to be elected. I mean, it's a, it's a long way away to, mm -hmm. to the fall of uh, 2018, but since you're in, we figure we'd throw you into the mix and certainly have you back as the election season heats up. Uh, give a 20-second presentation here as to why people ought to be you know, thinking and talking about you. Look, I'm a person just like everybody else is out there. I live here. Um, I'm not always in Washington. I see what's going on. I see what's going on out in the street, per se. I see what Rhode Islanders are generally going through daily. This health care issue is a big one. I believe that no one should be left without health care, truthfully, and we need to help these people with that. Well, I hope that over the course of, <coughs> uh, over the course of time that you'll develop a comprehensive plan so that we can take a look at well, it. I will. I level. will. I mean, I've actually, I actually have committees that we're putting together. Okay. Well, good luck. It's good to meet you. We wish you the best of luck. Uh, it's a great democracy. Congressman, he's going he's gonna to leave office on one day, you know, well, either on his <laughs> own or by the competition. Whatever way you look at it. So, good luck. Final word and we come back. Stay with me. Shuffle around the schedule a little bit for Dan York's State of Mind. We'll revisit a conversation with Dr. David Dooley, who just signed a new contract with URI that'll come up tomorrow night. And uh, Kevin McNamara from the Providence Journal on his coverage of the Patriots in the college basketball season on the Friday program. We will see you tomorrow as well on the radio, or hear from you at least, 3 to 6 on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.